Our next speaker is um, Dr. Um, Jessica Walsh. So Jessica is currently working at, uh, as a critical minerals postdoc researcher at the Uni of Adelaide, where and um, within the critical the Australian um, Critical Minerals Research Centre. Her work is um, focusing on, on how and where deposits of critical minerals such as rare earths uh, are formed within the Australian continent. Um, and today she's going to be speaking to us about critical minerals, uncovering the rare earth element potential of zircon. Welcome, Jessica. Lovely, thank you, Adrian. And thank you very much to the Geological Survey of South Australia as well for inviting me up here. And by God, it is bright. Wow, <laughs> everyone was not lying. We're all good though. Um, yeah, all right, let's, um, let's get underway. Um, so I, of course, would like to begin my talk by acknowledging and paying respects to the Kaurna people, the traditional custodians on the lands um, on which I'm presenting here today and from where we're all, I guess, sitting down. Um, and I acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and the relationship of the Kaurna people to country, and I respect and uh, value their past, present and ongoing connection to land and cultural beliefs. Alrighty, so critical minerals. Um, I'm assuming a lot of people in the audience already know what these are all about, but we'll do a quick run through anyway. So critical minerals are metallic and also non-metallic elements. And what's really pivotal and important about these particular elements or minerals is that they're actually absolutely essential for modern technologies, for economies, um, and for national security. So think of renewable energy systems, infrastructure, transport, um, high-tech equipment um, and defence systems. So what's super peculiar about these is that there's actually a risk to their supply chains. So this means that, you know, at any given moment, we may not be able to secure these particular minerals or these elements. Um, and this could be due to, say, geological scarcity, but it could be a lot more complicated than this as well. So it could be due to geopolitical, say, economic or even social issues as well. So examples of critical minerals include like lithium, cobalt, titanium, PGEs, and of course, rare earth elements. And that's what I'll be talking to you about today. So rare earth elements, sometimes they get a little bit confused and they're assumed to be just critical minerals or they encompass all of the critical minerals. So you see that a lot in popular media, but that's not necessarily the case. They fall under the umbrella of critical minerals. So when I'm talking about rare earth elements, um, I'm talking about the lanthanide, so that's the group of 15 elements right at the bottom of the periodic table, almost at the bottom, um, and I also include yttrium in that as well. So some examples just on the screen, you've got lanthanum, neodymium, praseodymium, terbium, ytterbium. All right, so for the talk today, I'll be talking to you about unconformity-related rare earth deposits. So I'm originally from New South Wales. My field site is in WA, and I'm speaking to a South Australian audience. However, I do think there's some really key learnings to take away from this work that can absolutely be, be applied to, to South Australian geology. So unconformity-related rare earth deposits are fairly recently, um, I guess, recently defined as a mineralisation style itself. Um, the paper's down the bottom if you'd like to look that up. Um, and what's really peculiar about this deposit type is it's entirely hydrothermal in origin. So we're talking about 300 or less than 300 degrees Celsius. And there's no connection to magmatism. So typically with rare earth element deposits, you see you know, your typical carbonatites, maybe peralkaline type um, igneous bodies and, um, and pegmatites as well. So what's really peculiar about this particular work is um, how these, uh, how the heavy rare earths in particular um, are actually mobilised and concentrated to form the ore bodies that I've been looking at. This really is a mystery um, because these elements, particularly the heavy rare earth elements, are really insoluble in low temperature hydrothermal fluids. Um, so this is super important, of course, because, you know, it's going to provide an understanding as to how these hydrothermal ore bodies form, but we can also develop some pretty effective exploration tools and strategies as to find more of these deposit types. Um, so where we are in the world, um, we're in this beautiful part um, of Western Australia. Um, so it's right on the West Australian Northern Territory border. Um, so, 
where, whoop, where my field site is. Ooh, hang on, it's all good here. We'll go back one, yes. So where my field site is here, it's called Browns Range, and this is the type locality for unconformity-related rare earth deposits. So this is in what's called the, the Tanami region of Western Australia. Um, but what I'd also like you to note is there's actually a whole lot of different unconformity type deposits within northern Australia. So these are all the uh, yellow circles. So we've got Killy Hills here, Boulder Ridge, my site that I'm looking at here at Browns Range. And then right up the top um, in the Kimberley Basin, we have another prospect called John Galt. Um, so it's really quite broad in the sense. Um, there's, you know, hundreds of kilometres between these particular mineralisation styles or these deposits or prospects. So if I take you now over to the geological map here, um, so the deposit itself, I want you, there's only two, <laughs> um, I guess, formations that I want you to really consider or remember today. So there's the Browns Range Metamorphics and this is the basin, sorry, this is the basement material um, that the, the deposits are actually mainly hosted in. Um, so I will get this one up now. Yep. Um, so this is around 3.2 to 2.5 GA. Um, it's an Arco sandstone. It's um, only actually, you know, uh, not metamorphosed a lot. <laughs> it's only slightly foliated. Um, and then on top of that, lying unconformably on top, is the Birundudu Basin. Um, and mineralisation itself is 1.6 to 1.6... Uh, 1.65 to 1.6 GA. So now, with regard to mineralizations, uh, what does that actually look like on site? Um, so again, that age is 1.65 to 1.6 GA. Um, and importantly, this actually post-states magmatism and metamorphism. The mineralization itself is actually quite simple, which is, which is nice, I guess, for a rare earth element deposit, because sometimes it can be very complex. So it's dominated by xenotime um, and then with minor fluorensite as well. With regard to style, uh, the ore bodies are planar, or the planar ore bodies, sorry, are hosted in quartz xenotime veins and breccias. Um, they're hosted in really steeply dipping fault zones, um, and the highest grades actually occur as chaotic to mosaic type breccias. But again, the key takeaway is that they're really heavy rare earth element rich, and again, hydrothermal in origin. Now, I guess the most important thing to consider about these particular unconformity type rare earth deposits is where exactly have the source of these rare earths come from? Has it been this bottom unit, the Browns Range Metamorphics, or is it actually the overlying Birundudu group or the Gardener Sandstone, which is the basal, um, fill, uh, basal sorry, formation of that basin? Um, so what we've found is it's actually the, the Browns Range Metamorphics, this really um, old 3.2 to 2.5 GA, GA Arcos type sandstone. So the Browns Range Metamorphics um, slow a show sorry a depletion in middle um, to heavy rare earths, and so we can see this here just on our spider plot. Um, and this is indicating some leaching of rare earths from the Browns Range Metamorphics themselves. And so this has actually been based on fluid inclusion studies. Um, been transported by saline fluids. And this is what we see as the mineralisation at Browns Range and in a lot of these other different deposits that we see across North and Western Australia. Um, and also, epsilon neodymium values of minus 20. Um, and so this has been calculated to ore age of 1.65. So we can see down the bottom here, um, these are all... I guess in situ xenotime against bulk rock, and this is just in the brown here. So these are showing fairly similar, I guess, type values, whereas the, the overlying sediments, the Gardner sandstone of the Beer and Doodoo group, that's plotting way up here. Um, so I think this is a pretty nice indicator um, that, you know, is really tracing our metal source. So this is all well and good. We understand that the, the rare earths are, you know, most likely sourced from this bottom unit, this Browns Range metamorphics. But we want to look a little bit deeper and think where within the mineral assemblage um, are we actually getting these rare earths from, from within the rock. So what we did to try and figure this out is what's called an element distribution budget. So we looked at the whole rock itself um, and we can see it's 
it's pretty boring <laughs> in a sense of it just contains a whole lot of quartz, muscovite, north clays, really typical of an arco sandstone. That's exactly what it is. However, there are accessory phases in the rock which are quite interesting and only makes up a really small percentage, you know, less than 1% of the rock. But we know that accessory minerals usually host all the really delicious good stuff. So we ended up looking at the whole rock geochemistry and all of the chemistry of the different accessory minerals as well and cross-compared those to then create what's called a budget to see where are our rare earths being hosted within those minerals, what contains the most. And then so our data is showing that zircon is actually hosting the majority of the rare earths. So this is really cool. So zircon primarily host, is primarily hosted in you know, the Browns Range uh, metamorphics, in the Browns Range metamorphic zircon specifically. And that zircon is only making up a tiny percent of the rock as well. So we're talking about 0.03 weight percent of the bulk rock is actually made up of these zircon. Um, I will admit that these, you know, light rare earths, the thorium, uranium and phosphorus, are pretty poorly balanced. Um, and that could be a case of maybe, I, you know, I just couldn't see anything that was big enough that I could actually hit with the laser. Um, I guess the question is also, like, OK, that's fantastic based off the geochemistry. You know, it makes sense to then be looking further into zircon. But why are we going to target zircon? I mean, the first instance kind of made me think, wow, these are terrible. Maybe we should look at them further. So these, so for anybody who's worked on zircon, you know, maybe they, <laughs> you know, it really makes you recoil looking at these poor things. Um, yeah, so they're, they're really radiation damaged. Um, they're porous and later on I'm going to, you know, convince you that they're also very amorphous. They're sp almost sponges, if you will. There's numerous fractures and voids within them as well. Um, and they've got really high concentrations of trace elements, particularly rare earth elements within these zircon, which is really, really nifty. I will just note as well that the laser spots are really peculiar too. It kind of doesn't quite ablate quite properly, which is interesting, which is making me think as well, you know, maybe we've got water in here as well, and Raman results have actually told us that, but I won't get into that. Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> So now, just a little bit of zircon uh, chemistry. So we've got um, the, ooh, whoopsie do. Just can't get my head around that, can I? Um, so we've got the total major elements as percent down the bottom against SiO2 and ZrO2 up the, up the top here, up the y-axis. Um, so there's a wide range of, of major element totals. Um, and if we look at just one group, if we look at the SiO2, um, SiO2 group just in here, um, we can see that the majority, well, sorry, there's a minority of analyses that actually show really nice high totals. So think of this, you know, those, that green little dot there as being like your theoretical end member of a pure, happy as Larry looking zircon. That's where you would want to be and that's where you would expect, you know, that's if you were, you know, dating zircon, you'd really want it to be sitting somewhere around in there. But the majority are actually showing, you know, less than 95 weight percent, um, you know, majority of totals. So this is, again, further indicating... Um, oh, my gosh, we've only got one minute, really. Gosh, I've just too much fun here. So this is really indicating that the Browns Range, uh, the Browns range Zircon are far from pristine Zircon in chemistry and Zircon structure. So I'm really just going to zip through this. So I know you've all been waiting to see how much... You know, we've actually got in here, we've got up to six weight percent um, of rare earth elements and yttrium within the zircon. So in a normal igneous zircon, you might have, you know, up to one weight percent. So this is astronomical stuff. Really, really incredible. So we'll jump through all of this because I've really just put too many slides in here and I've got really excited. Um, but what I will show here is that the... Uh, you know, these are some spider plots um, of rare earth elements in zircon. All of the coloured bits here are all of your, um, all of the zircon, which plots quite similarly to, to the bulk ore as well. So that's super peculiar. So we're getting a bit of a, a taste of there must be, you know, a zircon being crystallised, it's being metamicked um, or radiation damaged. Um, it's creating these porous pathways and then there's this uptake um, of non-formula elements. I've got a video here. 
No, you're going to miss it. Sorry. <laughs> um, so then what we've got here is just a little, take you really quickly just through some really fun slides of looking at the chemistry on a really small level. So we're looking here at, so we've got one particular zircon grain here of taking the tiniest little slice out um, and then we can actually analyse it for its chemistry. So this is fantastic in showing us that, wow, you know, we've got thorium and yttrium um, really partitioning into really nice bands with each other um, and they're, you know, working in opposition, I guess, to the silicon and zirconium. Just to reiterate that the structure, these things are absolutely, I guess, busted, if you will, at the micron scale and as they are at the nano scale as well. So we can see, you know, there's all of these incredible porous void spaces. And this is here looking at a, a scale of 50 nanometers. So this is tiny, tiny stuff. Um, this here, you can actually almost see, um, well, each one of these little dots are actually atoms. So we're seeing these amorphous type <coughs> zones within the zircon, which are providing space to actually take up or be sponges to the rare earths, which are contributing to this mineralization that we see. So I will just move along here. All right, so it's just some concluding remarks. Um, so the zircon themselves have been these amazing sponges for the rare earths. And we, we think that because there's been a real lack of thermal events, this has prevented any actual annealing from the zircon, which we, you would typically see in maybe more active, I guess, geological environments. So this has then allowed the uptake um, of these, you know, these elements that we're seeing. There's then been extensive heavy rare earth, rare, rare earth element leaching during the Mesoproterozoic um, by hydrothermal fluids, by these saline type fluids, leading to the mineralisation um, with an age of 1.65. So in that sense, thermal histories are truly quite important. Um, and I think exploration is needed into basins which haven't ex actually experienced thermal events, which have reset these zircon. And then my last slide is... There's a whole lot of different places within Australia that we haven't looked at yet. And I think the Birundudu Group, Pine Creek Inlier, MacArthur Basin, even margins of the Mount Isa Inlier. And then in South Australia, I'm sure everyone here is really going to have a whole lot of ideas about where we could potentially apply this further. But here's just an option, the Kariwalu. And with that, um, thank you so much for your attention.